she's in my head. William Turks, we got an exciting new week ahead for you guys. And we got an exciting show today. Uh, JR and I had a debate before the show began on whether we should make this a good show or a bad show. We voted in favor of good show. Okay, uh, it barely won. It barely won. But uh, now that it's won, we're not going to pull a Democrat. Uh, we're going to go guns blazing. Okay, uh, we have a mandate from the studio here to put on a hell of a show, a badass show. All right, now I'm not. You know what? I'm not going to let Republican get in the way. I'm not going to talk about bipartisanship about whether we should do a watered-down show today. <laughs> okay. Look, uh, I'll be honest with you. Later in the program, uh, Australia bans small breasts. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, we have a new color. It's called Obama Black. Yeah, that's coming later in the show. And, of course, sex slaves. So uh, all these things are coming. Roger Ailes was on this week. Uh, did they take him on sufficiently? We'll talk about that. Republican uh, hypocrisy up the wazoo, of course. We're going to start with that in a second. And then uh, Obama has introduced his budget. Uh, we will tell you some of the ups and downs of that budget. And he's got a little chicanery in there, uh, which conservatives are um, somewhat justifiably uh, bellyaching about. Oh, look at that. So we're going to mix it up in today's show. But I I'm going to start out on fire. <laughs> you ready? All right, look, Frank Luntz is a guy who has been a wordsmith for the Republicans for a long time. Uh, he's the one that comes up with clever uh, phrases and spins. So the estate tax is no longer the estate tax, it's the death tax, okay? Things like that, and I could list a dozen for you that you would recognize. Uh, he's, got, he's also came up with health care reform uh, words on how to kill health care reform. So he fed them to the Republicans, and then they put these out there, and some of which happen to be total fabrications. But they've done a hell of a job with it, and Frank Luntz has had a brilliant career uh, because he's been pushing that Republican agenda. Now, he has the benefit of having almost no one oppose him because the Democrats don't know how to play this game at all, right? But now he's put on, got a new project, and he wrote a 17-page memo called The Language of Financial Reform. The point of this memo is to kill financial reform. Now, that's not conjecture, it's in the memo. First, he tells you, and this is, I mean, every part of this is brilliant. Uh, we need to, quote, acknowledge the need for reform that ensures that this never happens again, this kind of economic collapse. That, quote, the status quo is not an option, and you should never forget the impact of this on your audience, and even advises uh, the Republicans to promote themselves as the agents of change. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Then he tells them, how to kill the bill, how to kill financial reform. Starts out by saying you should pretend to be in favor of reform, you should pretend that you're the one who's going to bring reform, and then kill it entirely. This memo is Republican 101. It's a smoking gun, okay? Now, and he's just getting warmed up. So, um, he says, look, or, these are quotes, ordinarily calling for a new government program to protect consumers would be extraordinarily popular. So he acknowledges that this bill should be extraordinarily popular, right? Because we're looking to protect consumers with it. But he continues, but these are not ordinary times. The American people are not just saying no, they're saying hell no to more government agencies, more bu bureaucrats, and more legislation crafted by special interests. So, what's the point there? And we want to kill the bill. This helps uh, protect consumers. So how do we have to frame it? We ha and remember, this is about language and how you frame things. We have to frame it by pretending that it's more bureaucrats, more government involvement, and more about special interests. We're going to get to more of that in a second because that's just pure genius. Uh, he continues, quote, public outrage about the bailout of, b of banks on Wall Street is a simmering time bomb set to go off on Election Day. Frankly, the single best way to kill any legislation is to link it to the big bank bailout. Now, okay, begin to understand the genius now, right? This bill wants to prevent all bailouts in the future. We want to regulate so we don't have to do any more bailouts, right? Luntz says, turn that on its head and pretend that there's a big bank bailout in the bill. In fact, he tells them later, you know what? Just say it's in the bill. Now, Huffington Post caught up with him, and they asked him, hey, so where is it in the bill, this big bank bailout? In fact, they're calling it the permanent bailout. 
We, we already have Representative Jerry Moran, uh, a Republican of Kansas, who's talking about it on the floor of Congress. And so this Republican talking point is coming. It's what they're calling the equivalent of the death panels in the health care debate, uh, the permanent bailout. So they asked Luntz, point blank, where is it in the bill? You show us where it is, and okay, then we'll take a look at it. He says, quote, and now you can see what a lie it is here. Frank Lutz says, it is in the fine print of the legislation in stuff that was added to the House effort that the Senate has been talking about whether it will keep or not keep it. Do you understand? There is no specific provision. He, he wrote a whole 17-page memo about how you should pretend that this is in favor of the bailouts. When he, there is no provision. There's no such thing. He, it's in the stuff between the House and the Senate. I can't pinpoint it to you because I made it up. You think if there was a specific provision, Luntz, after writing a 17-page memo, couldn't just flat out tell you what it is? They're lying. But, okay, look. God, there's such genius here, okay? Let me continue, let me continue, and then I will summarize. He says, the American people, these are all quotes, the American people are tired of add-ons, earmarks, and backroom deals, but they are mad as hell at lobbyist loopholes. You must put proponents of the legislation on the defense, forcing them to attempt to justify the lobbyist loopholes and exemptions placed in the bill. Highlight exemptions, broadcast them, remind them this legislation is filled with lobbyist loopholes that exclude certain wealthy, powerful industries from regulations. I mean, look, sometimes people say Obama's playing chess and we don't understand it. And we couldn't understand he's eight moves ahead. <laughs> Obama's playing checkers, man. This guy's playing chess. He's playing 3D chess. Do you understand what he just told the Republicans to do? He says, fill the bill full of lobbyist loopholes. Then turn around and come back and say, oh, look at all these lobbyist loopholes. Well, this is obviously in favor of the special interests. Well, look at these Democrats selling out to the big banks. Did you hear about the permanent bailout? Oh, no, no, no. This bill is going to make sure that the banks get uh, bigger and that, uh, that they cause another catastrophe. Uh, we're in favor of real change, but not this change. We have to kill this bill. And what happens at the end? We don't fix the problem at all. There is no change, there is no reform, there's no regulation of the banks, and there will be another crash, and there will be another need for another emergency bailout, and at that point the Republicans will say, you see that? The Democrats screwed it up. <laughs> Man, it's, it's brilliant in about 800 different ways. Now, you think, okay, um, how do you know that the Republicans are filling this thing with lobbyist loopholes and then complaining about the lobbyist loopholes? Another story in the Financial Times today. Richard Shelby, the ranking Republican in the Finance Committee, saying, hey, if you want bipartisanship, you better kill the parts of reform that Paul Volcker wants. You better kill the Consumer Protection Agency to protect consumers and riddle this thing with lobbyist loopholes. <laughs> I mean, it's happening today, okay? You know, I was naive enough to give Shelby a little bit of credit uh, on an earlier day because he says some positive things about reform. How foolish of me. Okay, no, now that we're in the nitty-gritty and you look at the details, he's looking for 800 ways to chop this thing up. So Volcker had a great statement over the weekend. It, it encouraged me before I saw all this. And remember, Volcker's the guy Obama's listening to now. We hope, we think, right? And he, he explained four different ways that you can prevent this kind of collapse from happening again split up the investment banking from the commercial banking so that our money that we put into the commercial banks don't get endangered when they take risks in their proprietary trading. Makes perfect sense. Richard Shelby wants to spike it. The Republicans want to kill that because they want our money at risk so their lobbyists and their banker friends can get richer. But meanwhile, they got Frank Luntz writing memos explaining how they're going to pretend to be on the side of the regular people and they're going to blame the Democrats after they insert the loopholes, and they water down the bill, and then they say, oh, this bill is so watered down. Now, there's only two reasons why you'd play along in that game. One, you're an utter and contemptible fool. I mean, is that what you are, Chris Dodd, who's now saying, oh, I need bipartisanship. Oh, before I retire, I need to have a bill, and I need it to be bipartisan. Are you that stupid, Chris Dodd? Barack Obama, Tim Geithner, are you all that stupid? There's only one other explanation. The other explanation is, it's all a fraud. The Democrats don't want reform either. <laughs> and what they want to do is, they want to say, oh, 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 the Republicans twisted my arm. Oh, my God, I put the lobbyist loopholes in there, and I watered down the bill. 
and I, you know, I killed all the meaningful reform, and I killed the agency, and I killed everything, but because I needed bipartisanship, because the Republicans made me do it. Oh, now the bill is so riddled with loopholes that everybody's complaining. I guess we're not going to be able to pass it. What can we do? We lost elections. We panicked. No, we couldn't do it. Wait, did that happen before? That didn't happen in healthcare, did it? <laughs> Look, the bill, financial reform bill, is getting watered down as we speak. The healthcare reform got enormously watered down, and now is at a point where it might never pass, right? So, if the Democrats think they're smart and they're getting results, well, that is not a defensible position, because it is just simply not true. So that's why it only leaves two other alternatives. They're either idiots or complicit. So, look, I, I don't want to decide. You tell me. Uh, if you're a Democratic politician, if you're part of the Obama administration, if you're part of the Democrats in the Senate, you tell me. What is it? Have you gotten great results? No. Are you watering down reform right now as we speak? Yes. So what is it? Are you a fool or are you complicit? You answer it. The Republicans know how to play this game, man. They're so much better at this. Now, I'm going to get to another point about that in a second, but let me finish up the lunch memo for you. Here are some other cute parts of it. He says, oh, the Consumer Financial Protection Agency? Well, that would protect consumers, uh, so that would be very helpful. So obviously we have to kill that as well, because the big banks uh, can't make as much money if you have that, right? And they'd be making the money off our asses, of course. Um, not if you, they make regular profit off of commercial banking, everybody keep it in mind. There's no problem with that. Okay, that's called banking. No problem. Okay, the problem is using our money for their risk taking on proprietary trading. Okay, proprietary trading. In case you don't know, is when they say, "Hey, listen, I'm not doing this for any consumer. I'm not doing it for any customer. I'm doing it in my own trade here to make money for myself for the bank, whether it's Goldman Sachs or Citigroup or whatever it might be. It doesn't serve any societal purpose." And all it does is endanger our money when it's commingled with ours. Okay, so I just want you to understand that. So, wh how are they going to kill the, uh, the agency that would protect not only consumers but honestly small businesses as well? Because the banks are not lending to the small businesses. By of course, can I, have you noticed a pattern now? How are they going to do it? By of course, saying that the agency would imperil small businesses. They say, oh, if you do this, it will increase. Uh, regulation and it will increase costs to the banks, in which case they can't lend to small businesses. But they're already not lending to small businesses. It's an excuse. And the small business thing, that's a code word, okay? Uh, from now on, you could, you, for the next 20, 30 years, they'll use that same code word. When they say, oh, we're trying to protect small business, the translation is, we're trying to pre protect big business that pays our bills. But we're using small business as a BS excuse. And in this memo, it's laid out perfectly. And then the final part of it here is another quote from Frank Luntz. If there's one thing we can all agree on, it's that the bad decisions and harmful policies by Washington bureaucrats that in many ways led to the economic crash must never be repeated. This is your critical advantage. Washington's incompetence is the common ground on which you can build support. So what he's saying is, blame everything on Washington. Even though what happened was, Washington stopped looking over Wall Street's uh, shoulders. It wasn't over-regulation that caused this. It, caused, it was no regulation. So Wall Street ran amok when there was no cop on the block, right? And now Luntz is saying, look, this is a perfect opportunity. You blame it on the cop on the block. But he wasn't there, so we're trying to put him there. No, nope, you take him away again because you say that it was his fault. And do, so in the end, you would have no reform, and Wall Street gets a skate and do it again. Look, if you trust the Republican, and, and you're a conservative, look, I know the liberals don't trust the Republicans. Okay, progressives and almost uh, most of the independents these days don't trust the Republicans. I got numbers on that for you in a second, okay? But if you're a conservative, why would you trust these sons of bitches? They're not on your side, man. All they want to do is collect a paycheck from the banks and the lobbyists. You think they're looking out for you? They're, you, they're using you as the biggest fool of all. And they'll get you out there protesting soon. Yeah, stop the regulations, protect the banks. I mean, uh, government is bad. No. You'll be out there soon enough, trust me. <laughs> Tea party guys, they think they're against the bailouts? I guarantee you what's going to start in the next couple of weeks and couple of months is that you're going to have Tea Party fools that are inadvertently lobbying 
and, and protesting and marching in favor of the bankers that stole the money from us. All right, now, um, just to come back to what I was telling you about Shelby and Dodd and to give you some further details here. Uh, the Volcker suggestions that we were all so excited about. Remember when I put Obama on the cowboy hat, you know, about, was it a week ago, 10 days ago? And I said, it looks like, hey, they might be reacting uh, the right way to Scott Brown election because they brought in Volcker and Tim Geithner's role has been reduced, and I was excited and I was hopeful, right? Um, according to the Financial Times, Volcker's proposals will be, quote, either dropped or significantly modified in the Senate. In other words, there goes Volcker's proposal. Sometimes I feel discouraged. Yeah. <laughs> and Richard Shelby not only says, hey, listen, if you want bipartisanship, you, you know, make sure that this bill sucks and doesn't do any real reform. But here's an extra layer which I love. He says, if uh, the Democrats don't do this, if they don't water down the bill, they will be, quote, politicizing the issue. Come on. Come on, how much do you love that? <laughs> In his back pocket, he's got a 17-page memo from Luntz telling him how to politicize the issue and flat-out lie, right? And then he says, you better not disagree with anything I say, otherwise you're politicizing the issue. Now, look, that's why I get so mad at Obama for playing these nonsense bipartisan reindeer games, okay? <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing, man? You think these guys are operating in good faith? You're still trying to be nice to them? You're still listening to their threats about not politicizing and not attacking them, not calling them out on it? Here's what you need to do with Richard Shelby. Say, Richard Shelby's a fraud and a shill for the bankers. He wants to kill Volcker's proposals because he is up the banker's ass. Lloyd Blankfein, I don't know how he walks around because Richard Shelby's sticking out of his ass. Okay? You know what? You, uh, I'll move on to that. Look, I got so much for you today. You know how much Lloyd Blankfein is making now? The CEO for Goldman Sachs. Obama said, oh, the fat cat bankers, and I can't believe this. Uh, you know, they, I can't believe they're taking these kind of bonuses. I'm going to get them. I'll tell you what. I'm going to yell at them a little bit and say, bad boy, Blank Fine. Bad boy, you've been a naughty, naughty boy. <laughs> Blank Fine looked at him and went, <laughs> you're right. Get away from me, kid. You know how much bonus the CEO of Goldman Sachs, Lloyd Blank Fine, is making? He's decided to take this year. A hundred million dollars. A hundred million dollars. We're in the middle of one of the worst economic crashes brought on by Goldman Sachs. We bailed them out, then we gave them easy money, and we gave them a backdoor bailout. And when Obama says, hey, you shouldn't take that much of a bonus, he spits in his eye. He says, I'm going to take a hundred million dollars. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Oh, Bob, the ball's in your court. How do you answer that question? My guess is you're going to bow your head, and you're not going to do a damn thing about it, and Blank Fine is going to walk away with our money. A hundred million dollars. You know what that is? That's a slap across the face. That's Dr. David D. Schultz and his John Stossel. You know, he, look, he's like, look, this kid get, can get pushed around. Look at this. Blank Fine, boom, on Obama. You see, I'm going to take $100 million. You want to call me a fat cat banker? Do it again. Do it again. I dare you. He's not going to get up. He's going to run down the hallway. Look, Obama, I'm challenging you, okay? I'm slapping you across the face. And you're not going to do a damn thing about that either. You're going to let Blankfein keep his whole bonus. Even though you know $13 billion of taxpayer money went to a backdoor bailout of Goldman Sachs. You know, I found out over the weekend, Goldman Sachs' whole valuation at the time of that bailout was $42 billion. You know what would have happened if they didn't take that $13 billion from us? They would have crashed. They would be non-existent now. That was not a minor thing. That was a gigantic thing. They'd be gonzo. <laughs> Instead, he's taking home $100 million. Look, don't misunderstand. That's not the only thing that's going on at Goldman Sachs. Overall, they're taking... Their executives are taking a combined $16 billion in bonuses. Geithner and Hank Paulson overpaid them by at least $10 billion. You can make an argument that they should have gotten the $3 billion anyway, that they could have gotten the $3 billion on the open market on those AIG counterparty payments, okay? But $10 billion of it 
is indisputably our money, and it's going right into their bonuses. What you going to do about it, Obama? Oh, no, 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 don't politicize it. Listen to the Republicans. Don't hit back. Look at uh, Chris Dodd's uh, staffer. You know how Chris Dodd's retiring? What did I warn you about? I said, look, retiring could be a good thing if they're going to get out of this entirely. They want to be, leave behind a legacy, et cetera, et cetera. But likely it's a terrible thing. The reason why it's uh, probably a bad thing is when they retire, they cash in. He, they go and become, work for those same lobbyist companies and, and law firms that get paid by industry. So as they're about to leave, that's when they do their biggest robber, right? And listen to what his staffer says. Chris is retiring, so he wants to end his career with an important regulatory reform bill, and he wants to bill, make the bill bipartisan. He's not going to risk bipartisan support to make the White House happy. Bipartisan equals sellout. It equals no reform, no change. It equals we give the lobbyists whatever the hell they want. Chris Dodd is about to <laughs> cash the F in, man. Do you think we're going to get real reform from these Democrats? Punk bitches that they are. Sometimes I feel discouraged. Yeah. All right, when we come back, <laughs> what they should do, Young Turks. All right, welcome to the Young Turks. I'm your host, Cenk Uger, as the song just indicated. J.R. is producing and Jesus is directing. Um, the Obama administration has released its uh, budget for the next year. Uh, it is a $3.83 trillion budget. Right, uh, the expected deficit is 1.56 trillion. Now there's a lot of argument back and forth, of course, as to who caused that deficit. Uh, the problem for the Republicans is that there is cold hard facts that indicate exactly who caused that deficit. Uh, when Obama came into office, he had a 1.2 trillion dollar deficit. Now he hardly ever tells you, so I don't know how anybody's expected to know that. Whereas the Republicans say every day, over and over, it was Obama, it's Obama's deficit, Obama's deficit, Obama's deficit. Now, he mentioned it once in the State of the Union that he was given that deficit, handed to him when he, the day he walked into office. Uh, even then, he even was then. kind of a uh, little embarrassed about it and said uh, that it was over a trillion. I saw him in another speech mention that it was 1.2 trillion. Yes, that's the correct number. You should say that all the time, right? New York Times did another analysis of it over the weekend, showing that uh, 145 uh, billion dollars of the deficit can be attributed to Obama's stimulus package. Now you can argue that the stimulus was made necessary by the collapse of the economy, brought to you by the Republican Party, etc. But nonetheless, that's his choice. He made that choice, so he owns it, in my opinion. Okay, and then. Fifty-six billion dollars was a discretionary spending that additional discretionary spending that Obama pushed for, and that he definitely owns. So that equals about two hundred uh, billion dollars, which makes perfect sense because last year's deficit was one point four trillion. So one point two he inherited, two hundred billion he roughly added. You want to? You should hold him accountable for that two hundred billion. He thinks it will help the economy and that they'll make that up. All right. But we're going to have to see, okay? But the 1.2 ain't got nothing to do with it, okay? Now, next year's deficit is going to be 1.56 trillion. So you can make, again, arguments about the economy, the recession, it needed it, this, that, and the other thing. But I'll give the whole extra, you know, 160 billion to Obama, too. So over the last two years, his contribution to the deficit is $360 billion per year, okay? So it was 200 billion last year, it'll be 360 billion. The, uh, this year, this upcoming year, okay? Uh, but in both of those years, 1.2 trillion of it is clearly Bush's deficit and the Republican deficit. Now, of course, the Democrats would have to make that case for you to know that, right? Uh, but they almost never will. And instead, the Republicans will claim that Obama caused the whole thing. Look, there was a, a rare case where Obama actually did make that case, and it was when he went to the House Republicans and he was talking to them, and he was talking to Representative Hanserling. Um, I want to sh remind you of that clip here, show you that clip, and then show you what Hanserling's back to doing the very next week. Okay? 
So let's go to uh, clip number four here. Here's Hanserling making up a whole bunch of stuff and then Obama's response to it when Obama was talking to the House Republicans. Jeb, Mr. President. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, Mr. President, a, a year ago, I had an opportunity to speak to you about the national debt. Mr. President, shortly after that conversation a year ago, the Republicans proposed a budget, and unfortunately, I believe that budget was ignored. The old annual deficits under Republicans have now become the monthly deficits under Democrats. The national debt, this is what I don't understand, Mr. President. After that discussion, your administration proposed a budget that would triple the national debt over the next 10 years. Surely you don't believe 10 years from now we will still be mired in this recession. Now, very soon, Mr. President, you're due to submit a new budget. And my question Jim, is... Jim, I know there's a question in there somewhere, because you're making a whole <laughs> bunch of assertions, <laughs> half of which I disagree with, and I'm having to sit here listening to them. At some point, I know you're going to let me answer. Uh, that, that's, the, right. that's the question. You are soon to submit a new budget, Mr. President. Will that new budget, like your old budget, triple the national debt and continue to take us down the path of increasing the cost of government to almost 25 percent of our economy? All that's right, the question, Mr. President. Jim, I, with all due respect, I've just got to take this last question as an example of how it's very hard to have uh, the kind of bipartisan work that we're going to do because the, the whole question was structured as a talking point for uh, running, running a campaign. Now, look, let, let's talk about the budget once again because I'll, I'll go through it with you line by line. The fact of the matter is, is that when we came into office, the deficit was $1.3 trillion. $1.3. So, so when you say that suddenly I've got a monthly budget that is higher than the annual, or a monthly deficit that's higher than the annual deficit left by the Republicans, that's factually just not true. And you know it's not true. All right, now that was Obama getting tough, right? By my <laughs> book, that wasn't very tough at all, right? I'd have gone back to him being like, hey, listen, you Hanserling clown. Now, look, with a 1.3, 1.2, people make arguments either way. Let's, I'm going to go with a more conservative number, that it was a $1.2 trillion deficit left to Obama, okay? So I'll trim some of what Obama say. I go to Hanserling and say, listen, we're on national TV now. I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you understand anything about numbers? Do you understand and acknowledge here that I was left a $1.2 trillion deficit. Because there's no arguing it. It's not a, it's not a, it's not, he said at that point, I disagree with a lot of what you're saying. It's not a matter of disagreeing. It's a matter of facts. Now, do you, will you now admit to your, uh, you know, to your followers that you've been making up stuff about, oh, the monthly deficits now are larger than the yearly deficits were before? Out of your ass. You made it up. Okay? Where's your numbers? That's a lie. Okay? So, now, he can't do that because he's reaching out in a bipartisan manner. So we can't have that, right? Now, so that's why what Obama said there was seemed very tough to us because Obama never uh, hits the Republicans, right? But I'd put Hanserling on the spot and say, is, I need you to agree right now is a $1.2 trillion deficit that your party left behind. You never voted against those bills. You voted for all those Bush bills. Do you not agree, and it's not a matter of dispute or agreement, you have to right now concede that is what you did, Hanserling, not what I did. Of course, he didn't go in that direction, so now Hanserling, and I love in the middle, he seems like, he's like almost surprised, like, this seems like a campaign slogan. Oh, you don't say, really? Of course, you think they're trying to talk to you in a reasonable way? So here comes Hanserling, he's on the Washington Journal, and he's going to get a question about raising taxes, and he's going to pull more things out of his ass. Let's watch. Kathleen Wright sends us this question for you by Twitter. She writes, we're $12 trillion in debt. When do we start raising taxes to pay for it? Well, I, don't, I personally don't believe that we are undertaxed. I think instead we have a spending problem in Washington. Uh, you look at the record, uh, taxes are still going up uh, substantially over the last decade. Not true. Uh, and so uh, Not even taxes close. have consistently run. Uh, uh, if you look in the post-war era about 18 and a half percent of our economy. Now spending has been about 20 percent of our economy 
but under the spending uh, programs that we have now, in the next generation, spending is going to go from 20% of the economy to 40% of the economy. And that's why Republicans would like to put on binding spending caps and force Congress to do what they needed to do and figure out reforms and draw up priorities. I myself am working on a constitutional amendment that would ensure uh, that the federal budget doesn't grow beyond the ability of the family budget to pay for it. And that is limit the growth of government, with the exception of emergencies and declarations of war, but limit of course, the growth wars. of government to yeah. the growth of the economy. Otherwise, we're on the verge of being the first, the first generation in America's history uh, to leave the next generation with fewer jobs, less opportunity, less freedom, uh, and a lower standard of living. Who caused uh, that it, job collapse, you know, the, you punk? Your, your, the, whoever twittered who said, why don't we raise taxes? We, we can do that. But all the estimates are, if you want to balance the budget in the next 10 years by raising taxes, you will have to put a 60, 60% 60 tax increase on the American people. How many <laughs> Americans will no longer own a home, send a kid to college, or start a business because of a crushing 60% tax increase? That's the magnitude of the tax increase that would be necessary uh, to balance the budget. And I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I mean, this guy is awesome, man. He just makes stuff up. He's like, first of all, in the uh, last decade, uh, taxes have gone up a lot. <laughs> the exact opposite is true. We had literally record-breaking tax cuts in the last year. Okay? Then he makes up a number of, oh, if we in order to uh, you know, balance the deficit uh, in the future, we'd have to raise taxes to, what do I got here? Is it 50? Is it 70? 60 percent. Totally made it up. Okay, where? Which, which study says that? Which think tank has that? Where? Where? Nowhere, right? And, and second of all, let I me mean, think about this, right? Again, it's another straw man argument. We either raise taxes to 60% or we don't raise them at all. Can we try 40%? Can we try 42%? And can we try that not for everybody, but for people making over $250,000 a year? Can we try that? Nope, 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 nope. We're going to raise taxes. It's going to be 60%. And uh, the American people don't want that. Okay. So now he claims that he's in favor of uh, deficit reduction, which is rather curious because we just voted on a couple of things, including in the House, uh, on pay as you go. So if you're going to increase spending, you have to find a way to pay for it so that it's deficit neutral. Now, this is something that the Republicans claim they're in favor of or have claimed that they're in favor of for a long time. Came up for a vote. Guess how many Republicans voted for it? Donut. Zero. They all voted against deficit reduction. Why did Hanserling and all of his friends do that if they claim they want deficit reduction? It's because all they want to do is defeat Obama. And if Obama reduces the deficit, well, then they can't attack him politically for reduce, not reducing the deficit. So they're going to vote against it. Okay? So that's where you know they're 100% disingenuous. But it continues. Uh, how about um, job creation? Because you said you wanted job creations. In fact, we did a clip for you guys a couple of months ago where Boehner and everyone else comes up with the same slogan, and it was fed to them by Frank Luntz, which is jobs, 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 which is what they've been saying all along, that Obama's focusing on health care and other things when he should have been just focusing on jobs. So Obama puts together a jobs bill, guess what happens? That's right, zero Republican votes. They don't have any other alternative. They vote against deficit reduction. They vote against the jobs bill. So what happened to jobs, jobs, jobs? All right, well, in the Senate, they got a deficit reduction commission, which I don't agree with, okay? I think it's a fraud to cut Social Security and Medicare. But who proposed it? The Republicans did. So that comes up for a vote, and guess what happened? Most of the Republicans voted against that. It was their own proposal. That's the commission they wanted. Obama says, okay, let's do your commission. They vote against it. Why? Because they just want to kill everything that Obama proposes. And they don't want to fix anything, because God forbid if we fix anything, if the economy gets better or the American taxpayer does a little better, well, then they can't blame the Democrats for the problems. You understand how this game is played? And Obama's going to come and have a gentle conversation with this duplicitous sum of a bitch? Well, that's not how I'd roll. Okay. And if you care about doing the right things, getting the right bills passed, and getting the and winning politically, both of those things, you wouldn't let Hanserling get away with these lies. 
All right. Now, it, I mentioned in there that uh, we should, we, we need to, because I care about deficit reduction, raise taxes for people making over $250,000. And that's part of this bill. Now, it, there are interesting parts of this bill. Let, let me talk just a little bit more about it before I get to the taxes part. Because, look, in some ways, there is one Republican criticism that's right. As you look at the details of the bill, uh, they, the Republicans say Obama is going to do a spending freeze, but before he does a spending freeze, he's going to raise spending this year. And so by the time you do the spending freeze, uh, things have already kind of gone up enough that they can stabilize for three years. That's not so wrong in a lot of categories. Not in every category, but education is a good example. Um, they're increasing education by $3.5 billion this year. If you include the Pell Grants, which he proposed in the State of the Union, it's actually raised by $11.4 billion. So that's a raise of the Department of Education budget by 16% this year. So then you can afford to do a spending freeze for three years. So if the Republicans complain about that, I might disagree with them on whether that should happen or not, but that's a legitimate complaint about the deficit, okay? And about the chicanery of, you know, spending more now and then doing the spending freeze later. Now, there's a good argument against it, don't get me wrong. If you're a Democrat, you say, wait a minute, but that makes sense. I need to do the spending now to create jobs for, you know, stimulating the economy because we're in the middle of a recession. And then later, uh, once we recover from that recession, then we could do, you know, uh, control the deficit and do a spending freeze. And policy-wise, you know, I, I'm, I'm real close to agreeing with Obama on that, okay? I think you do need to spend more now. I think you really have to control spending at some point. Everybody thinks the spending freeze is ridiculous uh, and that it's, in the words of Obama, the candidate, it's a hatchet and not a scalpel. But I'll tell you, of all his proposals, I, I, it's one that I don't object to very much, okay? Because it's somewhat logical. It's a little draconian. But we do need to be a little draconian with the budget. You could disagree with me on that, right? But so those are things that's, that are happening. And, and, of course, military spending is also up in the budget. It's near a record. Bush, of course, set the record in 07 and 08. He averaged $176 billion in defense spending for the wars, just for the wars. And uh, Obama is going to be up to $160 billion. He was only at $130 billion last year. So all these things keep going up and up and up. If you really want reform, you should go after the defense spending, of course. But no one will do that. Well, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, too. But one of the ways that you reduce the deficit is by raising taxes. Now, you don't want to raise taxes on the middle class because they're already suffering and they're in the middle of the recession. And it's not smart policy-wise. And it's not smart politically, to be honest, right? So what Obama has is, in order to have some deficit reduction, some tax increases on people making over $250,000. But presumably, those people could afford it a little better, right? Uh, and they're certainly not the middle class. They're the top 1.5% uh, of the country, income-wise. Uh, not, uh, of course, if you're watching television. If you're watching CNN with Kieran Chetri, she thinks, well, is not the middle class people making over $250,000? That's got to be an exaggeration that she said that, right? Well, we have the videotape. Let's go to clip number three and watch for ourselves. Well, look, we put forward our proposals, which involve uh, continued tax cuts for middle class families and uh, actually some expanded tax cuts for middle families. But we need to let the, the commission hasn't even been formed yet. We're going to need to let the commission do its work. You also uh, talk about letting taxes expire for families that make over two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Some would argue that in some parts of the country that is middle class. Uh, well, there, I guess it's not the parts of the country where, where, I've, where I've been. Uh, we, what we're trying to do is cut back on the tax breaks for the elite, for the very highest earners, in part to help get this deficit problem under control over time, and also to rebalance the tax code. Don't forget, for the, not just over the past few years, but over the past several decades, the middle class has been struggling. Income inequality in the United States has gone uh, way up, and all we're asking for is to return those marginal tax rates to the levels they were during the 1990s when... Uh, the elite did quite well in any case. But you see, this is why the Republicans, part of the reason why they have such a huge advantage, because the media is on their side. Now, why? Because it's logical. It makes sense. In the parts of the country that Kieran Chetri lives in and the circles that she is in, everybody makes over $250,000. And they don't think they're upper class. They think, oh, well, you know, the guys who run Goldman Sachs, I guess they're upper class because they get a $100 million bonus. But poor me, I only make four or five hundred thousand dollars. 
they don't realize they're in the richest 1% of the country. In her circles, oh my God, you're going to do a tax raise on me and all my friends and all the people I know on television. Do you know how much television anchors make? We make a lot of money, but we're middle class. So they have all the incentive in the world to portray tax increases for the richest people in America as tax increases for you. They say, oh, no, no, that's the middle class, man. No, I can't believe Obama's going after us. I mean them. So understand who you're getting your news from. Almost no one involved in making decisions in that CNN production, whether it's the anchor, the top producer, the management, none of them make under $250,000. Okay? So they have all the incentive in the world to tell you, I don't know about these tax increases. They sound pretty bad. I mean, they're going to come after me. I mean you. Watch out for them, man. They're not giving it to you real because they're worried about their own ass. Young Turks. Welcome back to the Young Turks. This is Anna Kasparian and Jenk Uger with you. I thought that was very smooth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. By the way, why was that the censored version of the song? Come on, it's the third hour. We can get dirty. <laughs> dirty, dirty. All right. He'll get dirty on you. <laughs> I'd rather him not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Everybody be cool. All right, we got some real interesting stories for you guys in the third hour, allowing me to cool down a little bit. Okay. Are you cool? I'm cool. All right, let's start with Australia. I'm clean on the outside. Creamy on the inside? Is that what it is? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> All right, let's go forward. All right, uh, we're going to start with an Australia story. Mm -hmm. It's going to put me in some trouble. <laughs> but we're going to do it anyway. We're going to do it anyway because uh -oh, it's Uh-oh, an good. Australia story. Here we go. Controversy. All right. The Australian government has decided to ban small breasts in porn. Okay. <laughs> they feel that uh, small breasts basically makes men pervy wankers and makes them pedophiles because it makes them reminiscent of uh, young girls. It, this is an unbelievable story. Yeah. Okay. Now, the, the censors and the Australian government says... No, we're not banning all small breasts from porn. You know, if you're 40 or 50, you know, and you definitely don't look like someone who's underage, then make it, maybe we can make an exception. But otherwise, we like big, juicy knockers, okay? And you give me big breasts, I won't let that go in the porn in Australia, okay? Everybody's having fun with that, okay? But you come at me with that flat chest nonsense, mm -hmm. I'm going to call you a pervy wank. Right. Okay. I mean, no one can believe this. This is, this is outrageous. Yeah, look, I didn't believe the story. Tom sent it to us first, and uh, it, it was some weird publication called The Register uh -huh. some, that I had never heard of, and I was like, no, this story can't be true, right? And that just could just be a local paper wherever right, that's right. not weird. Yeah, right, right. but, <laughs> but it we just, haven't heard of it. It just seems so unbelievable to me that I was like, okay, I don't really know too much about this publication, so I'm not sure if it's true, but then further research revealed that it is true. And there are two specific senators in uh, Australia right now that are spearheading this whole campaign against mm. small breasts, okay? And uh, it's Senator Barnaby Joyce and Guy Barnett. And um, they're basically saying, yeah, if you see women uh, with small breasts, it basically encourages pedophilia, and we want to get rid of it. And they're also against uh, female ejaculation, okay? <laughs> they, thought that, they thought they'd just toss that in there as well. They're like, yeah, we, we're not into that, so let's, let's ban it. That, you know, that has no justification like pedophilia or anything. They're just not cool with it. They just don't like it. So. They're like, I mean, come on, that, that freaks everybody out. We can't have that. That's ridiculous. Oh, male ejaculation, wherever it might be, you know, I've heard of these things called facials or bukkakis or whatever it might be. That's cool. Big tits, male ejaculation, Australian censors are it. Right. Small breasts, female ejaculation, can't have it, can't play with it, can't win with it. Okay. And I love the porn industry's excuse on this one. They're like, hey, dude, it's mainly fake. Okay? We do like a little lube and then... <laughs> okay? They're not really ejaculating like that, right? And so can we show it since it's not real? Well, the censors are considering it. Right. Now, the censors uh, are giving two uh, reasons for the bans, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the first reason is that it depicts, uh, that the depi depictions are a form of urination, which is banned under the label of golden showers in the classification guidelines. I mean, I love these rules. I mean, whenever you have the government talking about golden showers, it's always a win. 
<laughs> and second of all, why is female ejaculation a golden shower, but male ejaculation isn't? Right, exactly. No, 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 this is sexist. It's not okay. <laughs> it's totally, it, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's absurd. This is the, look, you know how Republicans here talk about over-government regulation? This is over-government regulation. But of course, ironically, this is the kind of regulation that conservatives love, mm -hmm. right? They don't want the government interfering with the banks as they rip us off. But if they're going to get into your bedroom or what kind of porn you're going to watch and what the size of the breasts need to be or, you know, what the, how, which kind of ejaculation is allowed or not, they're all over. Right. There's no way those are liberal sent. I think. <laughs> I don't know as much about Australian politics as I do about American politics, but I would be surprised. And certainly here in America, those would be conservative senators. So, uh, look, my ruling is uh, on the small breasts, if you have a porn that is trying to depict child pornography but uses uh, people who are over 18, I can see how that would be a problem. Mm -hmm. Like if they purposely say, she's 14, look at her, okay, then you got a problem and you could make that illegal or censor it. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. If you just have a woman who's overage and doesn't have big breasts, making that illegal is insanity, okay? Censoring that is crazy talk. And on the female ejaculation, one, I never knew, I never believed it. Right. Okay. People are like, oh, isn't that amazing? I'm like, there's no way. No, 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 there's such thing. No, 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 no. I know that it could happen, mm -hmm. right? But it doesn't happen with the frequency that you see it in porn. Right. In porn, the women are going here and they're going over there and they're going over here. I'm like, come on, man, how many female ejaculating women could you find? <laughs> right. And but even if it's fake or real, let them go. Right. Let them go. By the way, this sends like a really bad message to women, too, because it's saying, all right, if you're a grown woman, all right, and you have A-cup boobies, you have the body of a little girl, and you are not desirable. And if guys, and, and, and if guys are into you, right. they're likely to be pedophiles. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, can't have it, man. Can't play with that. Can't win with it. That's it's just it's unbelievable. Right. I can't believe they did that. <laughs> all right, but they did. They did. Now, another Australia news. Uh-oh. <laughs> a new study indicates that 40% of women in Australia wear double D bras or oh, bigger. Right. That's big, man. That's nice work by Australia. See, we're back on your side. <laughs> now, why? Well, that seems like such an enormous number. Why? Right. Health experts are speculating that it has to do with the increase in obesity, mm -hmm. and also more women are taking uh, birth control pills, and that because of the hormones in birth control pills, it could make your breasts larger. But there has been a pretty I interesting increase in the number of women with bigger breasts. And it's not just obese women or heavy women. It's women that have very small frames, and then they happen to have large breasts. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> I, am I the only one who finds this to be a positive development? And you know, of course, they, in the story, they don't mention the woman who got plastic surgery to have right. larger breasts, but that's also uh, happened as well. It's certainly increased over time, and that leads you to the numbers that we have. Um, but it's gotten so bad, they're now doing breast reduction surgery. Yeah, there, there is an increase in breast reductions. Uh, one doctor says, his name is Dr. Goyen, and he is a surgeon in Sydney. He says, I was doing about 10 to 15 female breast reductions per year. Now I'm doing 20 to 30. That's not cool. <laughs> no, I'm playing. <laughs> Look, some people just need it. And, uh, and ironically, the larger breasts lead, you know, if, oh, oh, sometimes obesity leads to larger breasts. And then larger breasts leads more to obesity. Why? Because uh, it discourages women from exercising because they have a harder time exercising. And then that vicious cycle, or some might find it a virtuous cycle, keeps growing, and so do the breasts. Can I tell you something, though? Yes. Um, maybe this is TMI, right? But, no, I know this is bad, but I have to share. <laughs> Having a big breast does discourage you from working out, especially in public, right? Mm -hmm. Because, let me give you an example. Um, I like to take this one kickboxing class. I mm -hmm. love it and I hate it at the same time. Mm -hmm. Everyone in that kickboxing class, for one reason or another, is just... They have very um, humble breasts. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this one. Look at this one. They have humble breasts. Uh, would they be banned in Australia? <laughs> Probably. In okay. porn, definitely. Okay. Um, but yeah, like I, I feel like when I'm in that kickboxing class, you're jumping around, you're kicking, you're doing this and that. And it's, kind of, it's not just uncomfortable. It's kind of embarrassing mm -hmm. because you're just like all over the place and everyone else is, you know, 
in place. So yeah. <laughs> the problems that people have, you know? You know, like Kieran Chetri, she makes too much money and she's worried about the tax increases for her middle class family, right? <laughs> Anna, her breasts are not humble enough. What no. can she do in kickboxing class? They're all over the place. No, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing, though, because one time afterwards, the trainer, and I'm cool with the trainer. She's really nice. She came and she's like, well, you got to tame those puppies. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so someone noticed. No, but uh, sports bras, don't they? Then? They do and they don't. I mean, look, no matter what you do, you're always going to have some up and down motion. And it's, it's kind of embarrassing. I hear you. I, I mean, I got large balls, so I know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right, Jerry, I was going to say something. <laughs> no, I don't need to say anything. Continue, please. <laughs> no, the grass is always green on the other side. You right. Know? I mean, some women will say, oh, it's embarrassing. You know, I can't buy this particular top because it's made for, uh, for to hold up some breasts I don't have there. All these types of things. So it depends on the situation, I guess. Mm -hmm. Tall girls and short girls. Like, oh, I can't wear a skirt because I'm six feet tall. My legs stand out. People think I'm a whore. And then another goes, oh, my legs are so short and stumpy. Like, you know, it's just, it's whatever. There's always a downside, I guess. JR listens to women. That's mm. what I just got from that, mm. that comment. Mm. No, 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 because it's true. The grass is greener on the other side. If you have small breasts, if you have big breasts, there's always an upside and a downside. Always. But, you know, but it's true for guys, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I could have a six-pack. But then those guys, that get all the attention <laughs> from the girls, and that's kind of a pain in the ass. You always got to shoo them away. Whereas I'm very comfortable without anyone accosting me at all. So, mm -hmm. you know, upside, downside. And so I decided, no, I'll keep my gut. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I'm glad you made that decision. <laughs> all right. We have another oh, you know what? story. I'm sorry. Yeah. I wanted to go back to the, to the Australian censorship story for a second, too. Because mm -hmm. I was thinking, in the middle of the story, I was, I, this occurred to me. Who gets to make that decision? You know that there's some, some guy who helped to pass that law who's sitting in the censorship office of Australia right now going, uh, large enough, not quite large enough. I'll have to examine it a little bit more. Well, this one's definitely not large <laughs> enough. You know, I mean, come on. It, it's both the most ridiculous job in the world and, of course, in some ways, the best job in the world. And you can't have that job unless you censor them in the first place. Mm -hmm. My guess is one of those senators that you talked about, Barnaby Jones or whoever his name was, right? <laughs> He's probably like, well, you know, somebody's got to do the censorship job. So let me go ahead and take a look at all these different kind of breaths. All right. All right. Uh, Christina Hendricks, the Mad Men actress. Yeah, speaking of large breasts. Right. She was uh, at the Director's Guild Awards, mm -hmm. and she was wearing a very nice dress. Mm -hmm. And we have a photo of it. <laughs> All right, now there she is with the creator of the show. Um, and, and, you know, I, I don't see how those things are possible. Uh, so first we need to have a discussion of fake or real. Um, you know, I believe she's famous for them being real. Mm -hmm. But they seem ungodly. <laughs> they seem unnatural. Oh, but I'm not arguing against them. I mean, God bless. Well, look, I think that in this case, I can't tell if they're real or fake. Um, the dress just seems like it's so tight that it's just pushing them together and upwards. <laughs> so if you have real boobs, you can achieve this look. It is possible. Yeah. Um, In fact, if they're fake, they did a bad job because why would you put them that far up? <laughs> right, exactly. You see what I'm saying? Exactly. Yeah. So I'm going real. You going real? I'm going real. They look real to me. Um, but who knows? There, there's a huge possibility that they're fake. Okay, well, we, look, we bring the facts to the American people, okay? <laughs> so we bring you the pictures, you decide. We report, you decide. Uh, but I wanted to make a comment on one last thing. Can you show me the third picture again, Jesus? Uh, that was with her husband, right? The uh, first picture was, was with the creator of the show Mad Men. That's her husband. This guy's her husband, I should say. Mm -hmm. What's up with this dude? God, what do you mean? How the hell did he get her? He looks, he looks really young. Like, doesn't he look, look a lot younger than her? Uh, he looks like he should be playing World of Warcraft. I mean, he, he's 13 years old, and he's walking away with, like, this incredibly hot woman. Right. Who's now famous and successful and everything else. I mean, her, his name is Jeffrey Arend. Look at her. How the hell did he get her? And don't get me wrong, I'm not hating. I'm giving the guy credit. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> hater. Hater. <laughs> now, I know, no, no, no. I, hey, Seuss Chair, I hear you. It sounds like I drank a tall glass of hater. Mm -hmm. Okay. And an argument could be made for that. I want to give the guy props, though. I want to say, hey, nicely done. He must have a great personality, mm -hmm. right? Okay. 
talking about. You're the worst. He's not that bad. He's not bad looking. I don't think yeah. he's ugly. I mean, he's not a disaster. Don't right. get me wrong. I'm, pro I'm sure I'm worse looking. Okay, but he's I'm just no saying. Salman Rushdie. <laughs> ain't, ain't no Salman Rushdie. Okay, that's true. But I'm just saying, man. There's 14 year old kids all over America who couldn't be more jealous of this guy. Mm -hmm. And and you give us all hope, man. Jeffrey, you keep going. And uh, and I liked it, you know. And it gives. If, and I want to give credit to Christina Hendricks too. Because she's apparently also choosing based on personality. So, mm -hmm. unless this dude's a billionaire. Or unless he's packing it. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, no <laughs> comment. No comment. But, it, yeah, could you imagine? <laughs> By the way, that's, she's like, well, no, no, no. He's, he, he, you know, he's like 17 and has no personality. <laughs> but he is 12 inch. I don't think she's going to make the decision based on that. I hope not. No, no, no. I don't. Okay. You, you remember know. you remember that guy with the world uh, the America's largest penis? Right. And we did a story on him. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine her going out with him? Cuz he was a schlep. <laughs> I mean, he's in his sweats. He's like he's a mess. He doesn't have a job and he doesn't understand why. <laughs> yeah, he's eating potato chips and like curl. But the dude's back in 13 and a half inches. <laughs> right? So, we did a story on that earlier. And Christina <laughs> Hendricks is like How you doing? Now, look, we don't know what Jeffrey's got going on, but he's got to have something going on, so right. much props, much props. All right, Young Turks.